Hello, hello everyone. My name is Peter Alfa de Lizalde, and I am the communications assistant at Dance NYC. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs, and I am a queer, non-disabled, non-binary Filipinx person. I am wearing a black shirt with white checks proudly declaring that I am a New Yorker to dance, accompanied by a stylish pearl necklace and a black jacket with golden stripes on the lining. I have brown skin, a pencil mustache, and eyebrows shaped in a way that could cut diamonds, as they say. The sides of my head are shaved with hair longer on top that is combed gently to one side, dropping slightly over my forehead. I'm seated before a red virtual background that features a white Dance NYC logo on the top right corner. Um, I'm streaming to you live from the unseated Lenape Canarsie land, currently known as Bushwick, Brooklyn, New York. First, thank you for joining us for the completely digital 2021 symposium held on the HOVA platform. As we are at the mercy of technology, we want to remind you that there may be delays, sound issues, and changing circumstances that may occur during our time together. We invite you to extend us and each other great patience. Second, an ASL interpreter from LC Interpreting Services and Closed Captioning Services provided by the Viscardi Center will be available throughout the session. We will also post speaker information in the description below. And under the speakers module on the left side of your HOVA app, or the menu of your Google mobile app. This information is also available on our website. Third, feel free to post questions or comments you want to share with the community in the chat section to the right of this event. Dance NYC moderators will be interacting with you in the chat audience. There will not be dedicated time for a Q&A during this session, but there will be a session follow-up chat room in the community section of HOVA, where the moderator and a few of the guests will be available for direct questions. Lastly, we hope you will help us amplify these conversations. Repost, tag us, and share your takeaways on Twitter at DanceNYC, Instagram at Dance.NYC, and Facebook at DanceNYC. Using the hashtag Dance. That's hashtag Dance. And now we enter the world of negotiations of power in commercial cultural practice. How do we redefine how power is shared when it comes to commercialized dance forms that have been historically marginalized, other exoticized, and appropriated. Four artists share their experiences and offer ways power can be redistributed to acknowledge lineage, community ownership, and address material inequality. Inequity, lack, material inequity. Sadly, Anahid Sofyan could not join us. Instead, we'll show a brief clip of her work. And then I'll turn you over to a and now I'll turn you over to the moderator for today's discussion, founder and founder and executive director of Ladies and Hip Hop. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Peter. And as Peter said, my name is Michelle Bird McPhee, founder and director of Ladies of Hip Hop, mother, wife, daughter, and a devoted advocate for girls and women in hip hop. My gender pronouns are she and her. I am a non-disabled black woman. I am currently on the land of the Lenape people and I'm wearing a black and white head wrap, an olive jumpsuit and my background is a white wall with a window and lots of snow. Um, I would like to thank you all for joining us today. Earlier, Dance NYC hosted the conversation street, dance halls, living rooms, social dance and form, function and practice. And we're gonna continue that conversation around cultural dance, but shifting our discussion and focus to the negotiations of power in commercial cultural practice. We will explore how to redefine how power is shared when it comes to commercialized dance using cultural dance forms that have been historically marginalized, other, exoticized, miscoded, and appropriated. For this discussion, we are defining commercial spaces as TV, film, concert dance, entertainment, and competition. This distinct, distinguished panel of artists have been invited to share their experiences and offer ways that power can be redistributed to acknowledge lineage, community ownership, and address material inequity. So I'm so thrilled to be in this space with such a phenomenal accomplished panel of artists and cultural ambassadors. And without further ado, I would like 
each panelist to please introduce themselves, starting with the legendary Cesar Valentino. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a pleasure. Uh, my name is Cesar Valentino. I am a dancer, choreographer, designer, stylist, makeup artist. I wear many hats. My preferred pronouns are he, him, and his. I am wearing a black beaded suit and white tie and accessories and hat. Um, my background is a cranberry <laughs> wall and white curtain with plants. Um, I am a non-disabled Latinx man, and I currently reside on the land of the Nalapid people. Nalito, you want to share with us your background? Yes. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. I'm honored to be part of this amazing conversation. I'm thankful as well. My name is Nalita Torado. My pronouns are she, her, ella. I'm currently on the land of the Muncie Wappinger uh, land. I'm a Latina of Puerto Rican descent non-disabled woman. Um, I'm wearing a black turtleneck and in front of a white wall with my hair in a ponytail. And Jaquil. Hello, hello, hello. I'm Jaquil Knight, choreographer, director, um, image architect, um, pronouns him, his, and he currently on the land of Shumash. I'm a non-disabled black man. Um, I'm wearing a earth-toned button-up shirt with a little floral pattern in there, a gold chain and a gold ring. Um, and I'm in front of a white wall with a newspaper clipping and a plant. Thank you, everybody. I'm so, so excited to get into this conversation. I know with all of your experience and different backgrounds, it's going to be um, a super rich conversation. So um, I would just like to open the conversation, giving some thought around cultural practice and cultural forms. Um, I know for me, when I think about cultural practice and cultural forms, those words kind of illustrate for me oral storytelling, cultural traditions, um, cultural nuances and understandings, um, family gatherings, you know, the picnic, you know, the birthdays, the parties, um, the things that make our lives rich and give us a sense of who we are. Um, a sense of self-esteem, a sense of community, a sense of pride. And so I would like to ask the panelists, what is your lineage and your story from the quote unquote street to stage, um, to the studios, to the commercial spaces What with what we do? Um, can we start with uh, Cesar? Yes, thank you so much, Michelle. Um, my lineage and, and my background um, from when I started to the stage, I am one of the original founding members of a ballroom house called the House of Ninja in the 1980s, um, where voguing was still very underground. Um, I've been um, voguing now. I just celebrated last month 38 years of Vogue dancing experience. Um, 38 years of experience voguing since 1983. So I've had both the underground experience in Harlem in the Elks Lots on 129th Street and Lenox Avenue in 7th. But I was also recruited to be a dancer on the Deep in Vogue tour in 1989. So I'm one of the first people to bring voguing mainstream and worldwide. Um, I've been doing this clearly over 30 something years. Um, and I feel that it's truly a huge responsibility, but an honor at the same time to maintain the integrity, the transparency of the history of the community, honoring the elders and those no longer with us from our community in the ballroom. So that's really my mission statement. Empowerment, inclusivity, teaching the history and maintaining and preserving the ballroom and Vogue history. 
Thank you, Caesar. All the snaps for that. Oh my goodness. And M Melita, would you share us with us your story and your lineage in cultural forms? Sure. Um, so I, in particular, I'm a flamenco dancer, uh, also a Latin dancer, and I sometimes wrestle with even saying that as it's something that has been such a part of the community that I was raised in and such a part of life in itself, our home life. Um, I am from the Bronx, uh, and that experience for me, my when I think about that and how that has taken me to where I am currently in this place, I can only be but grateful because I remember the large sense of community, a pretty much diverse community, but but a particularly a predominantly. Puerto Rican and Black community, uh, and our play and our interaction of rhythm, of celebration, of struggle, of dreaming, all of those things are remained with me throughout my dance practice um, and it's brought me to current day it's brought me really in a place of wanting to keep that community forward um, honoring that community honoring this struggle honoring my ancestors honoring the everything that was sacrificed from my family's behalf just being here in New York since I was born here in New York and not in Puerto Rico uh, so that is that weighs heavy on me and that's definitely something that I'm very passionate about being whole and identifying myself as a Puerto Rican Latinx flamenco dancer Thank you, Navida. And Jacoel, do you want to share with us? Yes. Um, I'm from the South, I'm born in North Carolina, a small, small country town where family reunions and cookouts were the thing. You know, talent shows in my grandmother's living room was my first, you know, practice of dance. From there, I moved to Atlanta at the age of six, where I started to find myself in the midst of this Atlanta music hip hop culture, you know, um, from bass crank music from the early nineties, um, mid nineties to now finding it in the midst of trap and trending dances that happen in the clubs and in the streets. Um, that's kind of where I originated. You know, I also was a musician first, played saxophone for six years in the marching band. And if you don't know, marching band was a huge, huge thing of the South. And that's sort of where all of my discipline has come from, all of my, you know, attention to detail, my ability to work with a room full of people, um, anyone, anywhere from, you know, one, two, a one and two privates to a group of hundreds um, and being able to move people around in a certain amount of time <laughs> in a certain amount of space. Uh, that was all from the marching band and also the technique and styles of that dance culture as well has kind of stayed with me. Amazing. Thank you for all sharing those stories. Um, it really shows the intersection of cultural practice and, and how um, it's, you know, it's not just listening to one type of music or listening or doing one style of dance, right? We have, I mean, Jaquil was just talking about being in band. I was in marching band, but I also was a cheerleader and I also like played basketball, like, you know, but I also, I danced in front of the fireplace for the, for the, you know, at, at the family events. It was like, come on, get out here and show me this, this dance. And, and then how that's all tied into our identity and culture. And um, and also being, 
you know, a little older. We won't talk about how, but how much older. But, you know, I'm very, very aware of house and club culture, um, being a Philadelphian. And, you know, my first visit to uh, a club was my mom taking me um, after a hair show um, to the limelight, Caesar. After a hair show, it was a party for, you know, you know, the Jacob Javits hair show, right? So, so just understanding that all of those things play a part in, in who we are and, and the identity of um, cultural practice. Now I want to like flip that and talk about like when that moment was when you knew you were taking your dances that you learned, you know, in your house from your family with your friends, the things that you made up from the club, you know, from your Nana, and you realized like, oh, this is a profession and I'm about to make some money. And 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 then, you know, what what was that moment? Share that moment and then what you thought, you know, how you thought your path was gonna go from that moment. And let's start with Jaquil. Um, for me, that moment was single ladies, right? Um, I remember how I got to single ladies was Frank Gatson was holding an audition for Michelle Williams in LA at the maybe six months before, you know, working on single ladies. And I went in hoping that you know, not necessarily I booked the job, but hopefully Frank would see something that <laughs> I can offer something to his team. And from there, he fell in love with my freestyle. He called it a country fried chicken house dancing, you know, street boy, you know, <laughs> whatever that was. And was like, um, you know, can you come in and teach us a, a few grooves, a few of your isms that you have, you know, and you know, we'll pay you a couple hundred dollars. And then from there, once I went in to teach, he was like, hey, can you co-choreograph? He was like, you know how to um, run a rehearsal. You know how to speak with people older than yourself. You know how to keep the room on their toes. You know, um, can you come and co-choreograph the project? Then can you choreograph a tour? And then from there, he was like, I may have something a really nice project for you in a few months stand by. And then that led, a few months went by and he called and it was single ladies. And for me, single ladies is literally my childhood. It's moments of seeing my grandmother dancing at the cookouts. I see my cousins in it. I see myself at the football games. I see, um, I see me and my friends when we all get together and that favorite part of your song come on and you make that stink little face. Um, <laughs> also, also, what people don't know is a lot of that routine came from the magic of these chicken wings from a spot in New York called Giorgio's. Giorgio's used to be at 53rd and 9th Avenue and they had these chicken wings that changed your life, okay? Change your life. And you take a bite into these chicken wings and all, every eight count that you didn't have, become. <laughs> and um, so that's like the chicken wings at Giorgio's is also co-creator of Single Ladies as well. You know, the energy and the, <laughs> the spirit of, you know, um, having a good old chicken wing that could just make your day better. Um, but yeah, it's something about single ladies that I just see every, everything that I did growing up. I see my parents, I see my grandmothers, you know, I see my cousins. Um, I remember being at the teen clubs as part of that in there. Um, so literally when we talk about cultural practice, you know, single ladies is that for me. Thank you. Now, you know, you're gonna have people running out on 59th Street trying to find some wings so they can find their single ladies, right? Good luck, y'all. Um, Nalita, do you want to share with us that moment for you where you realized this was going to be what you were doing for the rest of your life and, and thinking about how to bring, you know, your cultural practice into um, a more commercial space and professional world? Sure, sure. I think that I wish my process would have been 
as as uh, as straightforward as Jaquel. <laughs> I'm loving the chicken wings. <laughs> I have to say though that um, it's something that I'm still fully. If I can, if I'm completely honest, I'm still coming into with full circle, and I'll explain why. Because despite having this urban upbringing and sharing within community. I went through a formalized dance program that was a little that was a little different and that required a lot of class and a lot of preparation and it wasn't I didn't make the immediate connection to the things that we did mindlessly and with uh, the community to I can make a living doing this. So basically the process from that to the stage was me getting hired to do a tour after I did not want to dance anymore. I kind of was done with all of the training and I just didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And I was called and offered a tour to go with a Spanish dance company. And I did that. And it was kind of like during that time also, I had gotten another tour to uh, work with Tito Puente. And I started doing that. And I was it was kind of like around that time that I kind of figured, oh, I can actually really do this. But uh, I hadn't looked at Spanish dance and made the connections with Spanish dance. And when I'm referring to Spanish dance, when I say Spanish dance, I don't mean Spanish as in the language. I mean Spanish from Spain. And that encompasses classical Spanish dance and that encompasses also uh, many other regional dances and flamenco. Flamenco is just a part of it. So I didn't see Spanish dance connected to the way that was that had a lot of parallel similarities within the way that I was uh, within my own culture and within the way that I was raised and it wasn't until I started working that and through the working and through the experience I was connected with other people and connected with other people and connected back to Spain and in Spain had the opportunity to have a way of looking at the dance from a very organic place which was uh, took it right back to the root so instead of the studio I went backwards and then it went right back to the root to the communities where this art form were birthed from and thrived in particularly the gypsy community um, where you have all of the rhythm all of the same parallel um, swimming upstream against everything that was countered toward, uh, countered uh, towards them um, in their daily living um, and in the joy and in the happiness and in the music of it all. And it was then and there that I said, I've got my hands on something and I'm not quite sure what it is yet, but it's now that I see that there's definitely huge parallels in these same types of communities and I came across them in very different ways um, and I'm really happy to have found them <laughs> thank you for sharing and I mean I think there is something really to be said about looking at it the other way as well right like going from you know only being in class and learning in that space and then identifying the, the like you know, registering those cultural identifiers or awakening them, because, you know, obviously it was part of something of, of who you are, um, you know, from from birth, but um, to then be able to see dance culturally, um, as well as like being, you know, presented in concert dance, I think it's just as valuable, as, especially if you acknowledge it, right? Because um, we have folks who see it and then still don't give it that acknowledgement or value um, within the scope of work that they do. So thank you for sharing. And uh, Cesar, do you want to share that? that yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, my background, as I mentioned, um, my family is Dominican. So as a kid, you know, you, you dance, you dance merengue, you dance bachata, you dance salsa, 
Um, but I was also incredibly um, interested in the arts since a very young age. So I can go back to as far as second grade where I, I had to be the star of the show. And I knew that I had to be the spider in that play wearing these black and white Adidas sneakers and you couldn't tell me otherwise. So I always had a passion for the arts and, and, and a certain fearlessness. And I, I, got, I got that from that family structure that I you know, was blessed to have. I was also a figure skater for many years. So I automatically, when I saw voguing and the spinning and the moves and the nuances, it came very natural to me. Um, for those who don't know, voguing is a dance that's an expression of self-appreciation. That's the best way I can describe it. And it incorporates um, hieroglyphics, um, posing like models in the magazines and on the runways. And because it's a competitive dance, you got to add some martial arts in there. Hello. <laughs> when I first experienced it as a young adult was 1982 on the pier, and it was beyond just their dancing. I understood, kind of like the capoeira, where it was like a battle, but it was entertainment. It was dancing at the same time, and I was hooked. Um, did I enjoy it? Did I love it? Did I practice it? Absolutely. I did not become fully aware of what power it had until I experienced it within the arena of a competition, which is an actual ball where people go and compete. Um, but the person, as I mentioned before, who recruited me and was a mentor to me was Willie Ninja. Willie Ninja said, and I have to quote him, I'm sorry if I'm using weird kind of words, but he said, child, this thing, you be spinning, you got that stretch, you're acrobatic, you're gonna be fierce when you grow up. Those were his words. I was like, but I am grown up. He was like, child, you are 18 years old, you are not grown up. But that kind of prepared me for the early um, experiences. He said, oh no, you're coming on the road with me. We did shows in Dallas. We did, funny you mentioned the Limelight. My very first New York club performance downtown was at Club Limelight on the main stage with Willie Ninja and it was some weird kind of punk rock fetish whatever party but that was my exposure to a major club at 18 years old um so i think i knew that i loved voguing and, and and experiencing that whole community and i understood you know the the concept of the diaspora and how people were displaced and needed to find a place to belong in the community and support for one another i understood all that from a young adult um but in walking balls and competing in balls, I couldn't help but notice that, that they were incredibly talented designers, models, very attractive people. And not that I felt better than, but I was like, I can do this, but there's an entire world out there of opportunities if you go out there and get them. Um, I was blessed because I was recruited. I was recruited to go on tour, to, to do shows, to do the House of Trade documentary. Diane Martell approached me directly. Um, I did the show, The Latin Connection, 1988, where we showcased Vogue for the first time um, on television. People had never seen Vogue. So I, people say you happen to be at the right place at the right time. No, I was a hustler. I was a go-getter. I knew how to keep relationships. I knew how to keep those contacts and I would follow up and call people and so on and so forth. So when I finally did the TV show and the House of Trey and I toured and all that. I was like, I want more. <laughs> I want more. But I think part of it was not ego gratification. Part of it was I had a, a desire to really spread the message of what, what I said before, what voguing was really about, an expression of self-love, self-appreciation, and about really educating people on the community and, and, and that struggle and that resistance that, that we experienced. People look at voguing now and they see it on YouTube and they think voguing's jumping there, slamming your back on the floor. No, <laughs> it goes a lot deeper than that. It's 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 really the best way I can describe it is it was a dance for our survival when we were growing up in the eighties. All we really had was each other. We were our support. We were our community as gay, Latin, and people of color. Um, and I'm one of the few surviving people of my generation that is still voguing and still teaching and still traveling and doing that stuff. Again, not for money, not for your gratification. Someone has to keep that legacy alive and that story going, you know? So I feel that it's a huge responsibility, but I'm grateful to be able, even this platform I think is amazing. I'm beyond 
<laughs> grateful to be able to share here with these amazing, you know, colleagues and, and people in the business. I'm so honored to be even considered within this group of people to share my story. So yes, I've known all my life I wanted to be famous or when I made that change or that transition, but I would say that when it really officially happened was in the late 80s. And I know I ramble a bunch, but I love to talk, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Oh my goodness, you talking about honored. I am so honored. I'm taking all the notes. Um, this just this isn't even enough in terms of like getting all of your backgrounds and your stories, especially you know those stories of Willie and and the Vogue community back then. I did I was honored and blessed to be able to see him, you know, in the clubs and perform a couple times as well. So you know I understand that legacy and that that world and and how important it is, like you said, to keep that legacy and legend going. And thank you for that. And I hope you are getting those dollars for you know teaching and passing on that knowledge we still got to get paid um so oh my goodness this is i just need i need more but i'm gonna i'm gonna i keep forgetting that i'm moderating and i'm i'm hosting so i need to get my life together but um going back to this idea of negotiating um and negotiating power in the in the commercial spaces that you are now all working in um i guess you know, my question would be, if you're talking about things like creative control, um, intellectual property, uh, pay differentials, artist rights, race dynamics, um, you all talked a little bit about that being part of um, the work that you do naturally because of where you come from. But my question would be to you, um, and we can start with Nalida, who holds that power in those spaces? So in those concert dance spaces, in those performance spaces, in TV, in entertainment, who's holding that power and how do you begin to negotiate what those things are that we need to uh, maintain our intellectual property, respect, respect for who we are and where we come from um, within these worlds? I think that's a great question, and I think that that question is always depends. Sometimes not. I'll explain. Depends is not. <laughs> Hold on a minute. Uh, it de it depends on uh, who obviously is hiring us and what the actual project is and all of the details that it that it entails. How much of it it's asking of you. Uh, in terms of flamenco, there's been I've asked I've been asked to do numerous performances and some of them were amazing uh, and some of them were outlandish and it wasn't I do I do think that it was not it was not intentional. What was being asked of me was not meant to intentionally be disrespectful a good amount of the time. It was basically just they were they a lack of information that they had. Uh, or at least I want to believe that because there is we don't know everything. So I, I have to remember that, especially a form that we don't have on a regular basis, a lot of visual uh references or audio references is not something that we hear uh, on a regular basis so it ultimately depends uh, there are certain things that for me in particular I try to uphold uh, and I take into serious consideration uh, and that would be obviously depending on what's asked of me I try I know we all want to make our buck and we all want to do the gig and sometimes that may be that may mean that we need to kind of commercialize what we're doing or be a little bit more open-minded with how we approach this it's not pure it's kind of a mixish kind of thing I think that for me in particular, if I can, of course, if the project is 
of integrity uh, and I'm asked to think outside of the box, I will always try to approach the project with an open mind, but still remain either pure within the way that it's either choreographed or with the way that it's thought out or set up. Um, and if those things can't be met for me personally, I try not to do them. Uh, and that is a hard call to make because uh, there aren't a lot of there isn't a lot of opportunity for flamenco in itself here in New York City or within the states rather. Um, it's a form that relies heavily on the um, the relationship between uh, dancers and musicians and musicians are far and few, very few. So we're always kind of having to jump over those hurdles. But if it's if it's within, and I've had to do multiple performances that I'd have that aren't necessarily the most uh, pure, and they've been all learning experiences and they've also taken me other places which has been I'm also very grateful for you have to be accepted I was in my mid-twenties in an area called Greek Town in the upper twenties and 8th Avenue and I saw my first oriental dancer, my first ballet dancer. We walked into a different society and they would tell you, you're not ready, come back in three months. It took me over a year and a half they finally accepted me. But it was, you know, like a little nightclub kind of a dance. I wanted to build a following, bring it into the mainstream. I opened my studio. My students were growing. I decided that I want to have a company and I want to choreograph for a group. I expanded my material to a book to Carnegie Hall. I wanted to work with live music. I had more and more dancers. I went the whole gamut. It, was, it still was kind of novel, and it was something people were curious about. Um, unfortunately, financially, it was, it was very bad. I've never broken even. It's very, very tough to be taken seriously. If you're not in the classic field, ballet, modern dance, forget it. The dance world was drying up. Wait a minute. I, I had to give something up, go out and work just a straight corporate job. There was no performing or anything, but um, it was paying for this place. So let's finish this part and then we'll do the whole combination. So it hasn't all been a disaster. There's a sense of community. It's, it's women that want to come who enjoy it, who get a lot of pleasure out of it. It's very, very nice. hang around and wait for somebody to accept me. 
I'll wait forever. <laughs> I guess for me, I've been understanding that I have the power, you know, so just as you have, you want to figure out negotiation, negotiations to work on your behalf as an artist or songwriter, and you go get licensing fees for the song to be played in films and commercials, you know, why should I not receive such as being the choreographer, you know, and creating the language right? The visual language that we all are now um, latching on to, you know, because even we all know is a social media has changed the space of how we receive things. You know, we're no longer receiving music how we did 10 years ago. We're no longer hearing music how we did 10 years ago. We're seeing it, you know, we're experiencing it, you know, and it's happening every second you know, right here on these things that we can't let go of, you know, and it's on YouTube, you know, it, we've become a very visual world that has changed the scope of how we as dancers and choreographers should be treated. And that has just been like a revelation of mine, you know, with now starting my own company and, you know, hopefully going out to speak on behalf of dancers, you know, dancers that I hire, you know, like even like things when it comes to NDAs and within the NDA, you know, it's hidden language that they can use your face, your likeness, your voice, blah, 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 forever, for free. You know, that, that's not right. You know, so it's starting to understand that we have the power as well as artists, as creators, you know, and Sometimes you, you may not be able to do the gig you wanna do, you know, but it's all about um, keeping that integrity and doing it for the right reasons, you know, and continually, continually moving the culture forward. You know, that's what I'm always thinking each job, you know, beyond the steps, everyone get holla, gets hype on the steps, the eight counts, but no one really sees the back end work. No one sees the, negotiation, the changing of the contracts, the no, you do not own that, I do. You know, the language in the deal memos, you know, so I've been working really hard on keeping the power, you know. Once I've understand that I have the power, you know, it's keeping it and holding on to it. Thank you, Jaquil. And Caesar, do you want to share a little bit about who has that power and um, how we're negotiating that? Let me first say that um, my fellow panelists, Nalita and Jaquil, said it so eloquently. Um, the bottom line is that the you know you have the power to decide whether you want to proceed or not. Unfortunately, like Jaquil mentioned, we're living in a time and a society where everything is visual and people are hungry extremely hungry for attention and for exposure and for likes and for hits on social media and on YouTube. So unfortunately, I'm a 50 something year old man, probably the only man my age doing what I'm doing. <laughs> you look good, CJ, you look good. How, how you doing? <laughs> um, this is a blessing for me, but in the same breath, I have to be aware that like Mr. Joquel said, you determine what's acceptable, and Nilita mentioned as well, what's acceptable, what you're not willing to accept. You decide and you make very clear what your expectations are, what you're, you know, what you're negotiating. And I think the education is key. Education, sometimes people approach me, they want to hire me. I gave an example, the jumping in the air, slamming the back on the floor. People have asked me, when are we going to do the shawam thing? We're not doing shawam things because I don't teach that. And I am an old man. I will get hurt and so will you, let's stop this. This is what's socially acceptable and desirable right now, so that's what they wanna see. And I've made allowances, like Melita said, and I've made adjustments to accommodate the client and I'll book a younger person that can do that and maybe give them a little bit of that and, and make the client happy, but while also maintaining the integrity and the transparency of the authenticity of what I do. 
um, paperwork, know your paperwork, know to cross at it, know how to read paperwork, know to have a second person who knows and understands paperwork. But I think as you get older, also you've had your share of experiences of the good and the bad, and you get to the language immediately starts becoming familiar. You can tell when someone's trying to play you. Let's call it what it is. Yeah, you, know, yep. you know when they're coming for you. You know when they're trying to play you. And I think it's in a very diplomatic, professional way. You can let someone know these are my terms. This is my salary requirement, um, and I need to know in seven business days. It's not personal, it's business. If this doesn't work for you, thank you so much, I'm gonna pass at this time. And you have to learn sometimes to walk away from things that don't work for you. I'll give you a quick example. I will not mention the client name. I was approached by a company to do a gig. They wanted me to be the choreographer, the stylist, because I'm also a stylist, so they wanted me to provide the makeup the costuming, the choreography, please make sure that you record the music also for our special customers and clients that are coming to our corporate event. Show them the product. They hated everything. They hated the clothes. They hated the this. They hated the this. They hated the that. And I was like, okay, tell me what you would like to see and we'll work something out. Right? And we can even go buy costumes. You have that in the budget. Long story short, they said, and I quote, Oh, by the way, we're going to be paying you and the dancers in gift cards. True story. With a straight face, as a gent, like a gentleman, we don't need to be breaking stuff and kicking stuff in the way and get arrested. No, no, no. This is this is this has been a pleasure to meet you. This is not going to work for me or my talent or my dancers. Thank you so much, and I wish you well on that. But this is I didn't sign up for this, and I wish you on the project. I, I go back to, I circle back to what I said about the dancers working for no money or little money because people are hungry. That same client or to be client reached out to me the following day in an email to let me know that yes, they were able to replace me and my talent with people willing to do it for gift cards. And here's the link to the actual performance. This is the kind of stuff that we deal with sometimes, but I think if you stand firm in your conviction and in, in what you want, and and really know, bottom line, three words: know your worth. Know your worth. It, it's this. It's just not personal. We're not going to sit here for three hours discussing what my worth is. You approached me for a reason. You know what I'm capable of doing. This is what I'm bringing to the table. This is my salary requirement. And I promise to meet you halfway. I think there has to be somewhat of a balance too. Like Nalita mentioned, sometimes the client wants you to make adjustments or things for their demographic or forever. And you make those allowances and those adjustments, but that doesn't mean walk all over me. So you have to be very clear in your language. You have to be very prepared with your paperwork. You have to know the laws. Please know the laws. Know what they can and cannot do to you. Um, and it's okay to bypass people. It's okay to say, no, I won't accept this job. Um, mentoring is super important too because you teach the other generation what they should be doing because if I'm not willing to do it but homeboy down the street's doing it for 20 bucks they think that they can do this so we have to also create communities and conversations mm -hmm. amongst our peers and colleagues to say look you know don't accept that job I've done that I've said to people oh if so and so forth calls you um, make sure that you ask for money they got it they can pay you so you, we have to mm -hmm. stand firm as a community versus, oh, I'll do it because I want exposure. Sweetie, exposure was two thirty five years ago. How are you going to pay me what I was making in 1988? Get out of here with that. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Communication, knowing the law, and really communicating amongst each other to support each other to make sure that we don't continue. Um, there's a lot of backstabbing and people are too hungry, so we need to educate and support one another, to me. I'm sorry that drag a little bit. But I agree. It's very, it's very sensitive to me as well. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Great. Okay. No, that was amazing. And thank you for sharing. And I agree 100%. And the exposure thing is always funny because you can expose yourself. That's what social media is for. So come on, y'all. Anyway, so this is a great lead in to the next question, which is a question a little bit about purity of form, right? So, um, and the, Nalita, I've been doing a little bit of research, so 
um, correct me if I'm wrong on anything, but um, to my understanding, flamenco refers to both uh, a musical form and a dance form. And although they can be performed separately, the music and the dance are considered as a whole flamenco. So uh, my thought is, and this can apply to any of the cultural forms, in contemporary dance, we often see bits and pieces of the cultural dances showing up and being used in performance and in co cultural spaces, um, chopped up, you know, not in its entirety. So, you know, we can look at performances and say, oh, okay, there's a, a hip hop step, there's a house step, there's some vogue ish kind of something happening there. There's some flamenco, there's some salsa, um, but all without any of the cultural references to the music or any, even really any purity in its form. And so, you know, thinking about these cultural forms in these cultural, these commercial spaces, I want to ask the panelists, is that okay? You know, um, I'm from a little bit of an older school. I'm in the five zero group. So, you know, for me, I, I am about purity of form. I like to see it, but, but then there is some, you know, I think artistic leeway that happens, so especially when you have dancers who are studying and learning all different forms, right? So is it okay? Um, and does it dilute or devalue those cultural forms to see them show up in commercial spaces in that way? And we can start with uh, Jaquil. <laughs> For me, um, anytime I'm doing anything, showcasing anything, presenting, choreographing, whatever, you know, it's always important to keep the, to put the art first, right? So it's not going in and creating from a space that's pure to the art form or the dance style, you know, and keep, keeps it as authentic as possible. You know, for myself, you know, it really wasn't any training besides the clubs. It was no training besides the school dances. It was no training besides, you know, dancing with my friends, you know, at the football game while <laughs> the game was happening, you know, um, so I think when I create, I always think to people who receive the music, you know, if you're going to go to the club, I want you to know exactly what to do when you hear this song in the club. You know, I have to think about the people first, you know. Um, and if we're going to do this style, if we're going to do this, you know, we're going to do it. And this is the foundation of it. But now let's take it up a notch. Okay. They've seen us all twerk, 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 but have we put it all in the pocket? Have they seen us put it in the pocket yet? Have they seen the musicality of it? Have they seen the, the um, added technique of other things with it? You know, so I'm all about just keeping things super authentic, but elevating, you know, what that is for me, you know, I, like I said, I come from a music background, so I hear music very differently. And I dance to music differently since I know music. Um, so I always just try to keep things in the place where it's pure, it, exactly what it is, but then let the elevation comes from the rest of the project, the music, the artist, the client I'm with. You know, I've been blessed to have artists who this past you know few years have been unapologetically black you know so we've been able to move in our blackness and be proud and to study it and to work across it um the continent to the motherland and work hands-on with people in africa you know it's been a very beautiful journey um which has made me like, just keep your shit black, Quill, you know, and <laughs> don't lose the countryness, don't lose the fried chicken, don't lose the seasoning of it all, you know, because that's what, again, make, makes me who I am, you know, and that's what you're gonna get for the project, you know, and that's again, back to <laughs> what Caesar was saying, knowing my worth, you know, if you want your project to feel like this, boom, I have the power because I know what I'm breaking to the project. Thank you. And just going back to your training ground and your rehearsal spaces, that is our rehearsal and that is our training. So, you know, listen, I'm saying it, all the things. And yes, we are in a unique time where we can be 
unapologetically who we are culturally. And I think this is a great time to push back on that power and say, no, this is what it is. But I, I think just posing the question of like, because we do know that there are a lot of people in spaces that aren't necessarily of the lived experience that you have to quill. So, but they're trying to replicate and, 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 do the same things that you do so that it appears the same way, you know? And so I think it's just, you know, knowing that, you know, again, having that credit and knowing who's doing what and, and where it's coming from. And so um, I, I pose the same question to you, Caesar, like when you see Vogue, um, I mean, obviously used and utilized in so many ways to sell product and all kinds of things, um, do you feel like that is diluting um, the cultural form? And do you have, like, what's your struggle, if you have one, with seeing it in those spaces? Um, clearly, it's something I'm incredibly passionate about. And again, because this was our lifestyle, this wasn't a mockery. And it's very, you have to be very careful sometimes on, you know, is it an homage or is it a mockery? And when it's diluted or looks diluted, you know, it's, it's kind of your interpretation too, like, well, are they paying homage? Is there, they've thrown a little bit in there to, but I prefer for people to at least make an attempt at learning about the culture before they go ahead and start booting productions. I'll give you a quick example. When I went to Brazil the first time to teach, they put me up in the suburbs in some town where all these kids go for hip hop competition and they would do competitions in the evening and, and classes during the daytime. In the evening, every one of those groups, there must have been 20, 30 of them, had the one super gay boy in the, the production in high heel shoes, would jump in the air, slam their back, and that was their way of saying, hey, look, we're hip, we know Vogue. No, you don't. Having the most over-the-top outlandish gay boy in high heel shoes throw his back on the floor wasn't even good. He wasn't even good at what he was doing. And, and and I addressed that to them. I said, for someone like myself, who was an elder of this community and one of the founding people of that movement, I'm a little insulted that y'all think that this is what voguing is. Do you know that the next day after we had that whole discussion, the B-boys of the hardest, of the hip hop, of the thugs, from the whatever, were taking vote with me because I explained to them, this is not necessarily a gay dance. This is a dance of empowerment. This is a, an art form. This is not gay, straight, feminine. This is, this is art. And when they understood that, like I said, they were better to able to translate that. I think it's a, it's a, it's a tricky subject because I, there's been times, you know, we're adults here, Michelle, we know this, We've given Sada like, mm, what was that little kickball change, hop, skip, and the jump at the end, attempt at hip hop, just cut it out. You know, and I think we're, we're somewhat biased to it because we're so passionate about the culture and about preserving its history and its authenticity. Um, do I feel that voguing is for everyone? I'd be selfish to say, well, no, only certain people could do it, or only this, or only that, or it must be done this way. It's a form of self expression. Whatever works for you do it while still honoring the integrity and the respect for the culture period <laughs> period if you do it in a way that's respectful and authentic and honoring the culture i think it's received well regardless period that, that's just my opinion yes panelists you agree <laughs> absolutely i'm taking notes and lanita lanita can you add to that conversation about performing flamenco outside of the music um does it happen is it okay is it not okay um i think that uh when you say outside of the music uh what do you what, what exactly do you mean i'm sorry so at the beginning of um i think this thought pattern you know just doing some research on flamenco and i you know don't know as much because it's not as widely shared i think the first time i even saw it in person was at Faisal's, which is no longer in existence. And I would just stand in the room, like peek at the open doors and just listen and watch uh, uh, the flamenco dance. It was amazing. But um, I was saying that, you know, it's an art form that is not only the dance, but it's the dance and the music. And so that, is it okay for people to borrow from the form flamenco and only do movement of it and be outside of the form itself um, without the music or without specific cultural reference? 
Okay, so I think uh, for the most part, um, I think the di different from, I'm in alignment with everything that everyone has said so far because I'm the purest of the purest. However, um, this is a cultural dance and is not a commercial dance. And that's a really, that's something that really needs to be taken into consideration. I've been asked many times uh, to talk about uh, a f fusion pieces or to just look at pieces that are that incorporate lots of other dance. And I think that uh, I would like to see if it's something a fusion, something that has just flares or tastes of, of, it's not meant to be a hardcore flamenco number, for instance. It's meant to have a lot of other things. That is the big goal, not my purity. So if that's the case, when I'm looking at that, what I would like to see are references of that language, of that dance style, that preserve the integrity and honor that to the best of that ability within the context of whatever piece they're creating. Now, how do you go about that? By doing your homework, by jumping into class, and I'm not saying to dive into 10 years of class, but it requires, I would want to do my homework and get the information that I would need so that it was something that was as genuine as possible. And that is my personality. That's not everyone's uh, obvious, obviously personality, and that may not be on everyone's time frame, depending on what that project is. Now, if it was something that was a commercial form, where flamenco has to jump, has to be present in there, we're talking most of the time that not all the time, but most of the time, those musicians aren't there. And if the musicians aren't there, how do you, you know, make that as flamenco as possible? That is, uh, you know, that's a whole other task. I don't, I can, I consider myself very much a purist, but I will, I will say something a little bit counter because of the fact that I do flamenco as a cultural dance. Sometimes if there's flavors and colors of flamenco within a commercial aspect, that definitely enables more visibility or at least a curiosity back to what the original um, art form is. And that I'm always open and welcome to and open to. And if that is done with like with gusto, with integrity, then yeah. But for the most part, you really I I would I would want to see something as as pure as possible if 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 that's the case. It's it's we're referencing back the communities that they came from uh, and honoring what that was. And in, especially when it comes to flamenco, where it was birthed, it was a form that was birthed out of that was their their voice for their expression for their oppression. Um, so it doesn't really ride with the commercial with the commercial kind of like um, uh, scenario, but if it can be worked in in a way that is is that that is upheld and that's referenced, then I think that that's brilliant. Thank you. Um, and that, and and that kind of leads me to into my next question um, because I think some of um, what happens in these spaces and commercial spaces and the reason that we don't see uh, representation or acknowledgement is because of of what I'm going to ask next and you know I I I don't want to lead too much but I just if this situation has happened to you, or um, or 
you can just give some insight on what you would do if it happened, um, that would be great. So the question is, have you ever been presented with a situation where a choreographer or a dancer um, has been hired for an opportunity that is not representative of their lived experience. So meaning they have no clue of what this cultural form is about um, and what the form is supposed to represent. Um, could you share some thoughts on if or how that person, that choreographer should give up that, that job or share the power um, in that job to uplift those who might be better suited or aligned for the opportunity. Um, let's start with Jaquil. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Michelle, Michelle, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> That question is very interesting in the sense of people, um, how can I say this? How can I say this? People pay for what they get, right? You know, if you want the best, if you want the king, you pay for the king. If you want the queen, you pay for the queen. You know, if you want something not so much, you get such as, you know? And I think that goes, hand in hand with this conversation, you know, how, I mean, it's even like, we see it every three months on TikTok, right? You know, it's the black girl in the hood, she made up the TikTok dance, you know, and now the influencers done took over the dance and now they got millions and millions of people watching it. Now we don't forgot about the girl in the hood who made the dance up in her liver, in her bedroom, right? Um, you know, it's that same thing. And, and they don't have the swag, they don't have the sauce, they don't have the technique, they don't, whatever we, you know, we're all different, <laughs> you know, years here, but it's the same thing technically, right? You don't have the sauce, you don't have the energy, you don't have the knowledge of, you don't have the life of, you know? And I do find, personally, I do find it offensive when I see things, especially when I, like, I'm not even a vulgar and I see, when I see commercials and I'm like, how, why, who, what? Like who approved this? You know, um, <laughs> you know, and people like, even like with twerking, like I hate that word, like, cause now like it's just become such a thing. Oh yeah, I'm twerking, like, uh, like that's not it. Like that's not it because that is a technique and that is a pocket and that is a musicality and a talent there even within that space, you know? Um, so for me, it's been just a really interesting space. Like now, like I was just having this conversation last week with all the hip hop dances and street dances, you know, that we would know of and you attach when you hear the music, you know that dance go with that song or that style of mu music, that genre of music. Now they're calling it TikTok dances, you know, which is not the case, you know? because that's a dance style that's formed to hip hop music. And when you do the Whoop Rico to your crime mob record, that's what it is. And because you need to sit in the pocket here to that, you know, when you do the running man, that's called the running man because the record makes you do this, you know? Um, so it's like when we lose sight of where things come from, Caesar said it earlier too, you know, I think it's really important that as we continue to work and as we continue to pull, pull back, right? Pull people along with us. You have to also keep in mind the integrity of that genre, the integrity of that style. The, um, the leader said it too, you, you know, everyone, I think every big client or every job, the goal is to see a fusion of, you know, like, but no, it's a way to uphold integrity and elevate it, you know? Like, show me that you studied, show me that you're gonna give the, your best line yet, show me that you went in and you died and you threw up and you cut your hand and you sweated all day, you, ate, you skipped your lunch, you know what I'm saying? You went on a diet for three weeks or two months, whatever you have to do, but show me that you're committed to knowing the history of, 
you know, the story that comes with the movement. And I think now in society with things being so quick, we forget that all of our movement, you know, the leader, they come from oppression, you know, Caesar, they was expressing themselves. You know, my movement, we were doing the same. This was the all we had, you know, all, this was all we had. And I just find it really disrespectful when, you know, big brands, they have the money. You know, you have the money to call Caesar. Can you please come in here and teach foundation? You know, Nalia, can you come teach them the flamenco right? Can we, you know, instead of disrespecting the art, you know, completely, you know, and going to get someone new because they're going to do it for $10. They're going to do it for $5. You know, that's like a disgrace to the art form, you know, and it puts us back 10 steps, you know, the ones who've been fighting, the ones who said no, the ones who said that's not possible, that's not right, the ones who's teaching, you know, the style, the the pocket, the rhythm, the language of, you know, um, always have to take the back seat when, and people like to go the easy route, so get in, you know, oh my God, they have 2 million followers, they have blah, 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 you know, I think it's important that we as creators, you know, value ourselves as such you know yes i don't have the million followers but i know what i'm talking about so which so then you put it back on the brand what do you want to do because oftentimes i've seen i've seen a client go and get someone because of you know they know they can't do that they know they ain't taught no voga ever they know they're not from the streets they know they're not from the hood they know they're not from the east side over here you know but they got 100, 100 million followers two million followers you know and now a week in, now you got to call me because it's not quite what you wanted. You know what I'm saying? It's not quite what you, you're not quite getting what you thought you were getting because they don't know what they're doing, you know? And I think we can only do so much in the sense of how we can not control people, but how people operate, that's on them. You know, but I think it's on us to not sell out, you know, and to continue to teach, you know. Um, I always say my everything that I do is about impacting, inspiring, and encouraging the next generation of artists. You know, Jaquel's here for right now, but I have to make sure the next Jaquel Knight is better than me. He know more than I did when he starts, you know. Um, he knows how the paperwork should be. He's thinking for the next one after him, you know. Um, so I think it's that story of having that respect and keeping the integrity and always pulling, bringing back, bringing the nets with you, but, you know, letting them see this is how things should be done. You know, we can't, we can't do that, you know? Thank you for that. And, you know, I, well, let me put it to the other panelists. Are we, is there a way to address or, um, give advice to these folks who are out there stepping into genres or positions because the money is there and not aware of what they're actually doing. Uh, Caesar. Um, first, let me just say, of course, I'm going to echo a lot of what uh, Mr. Dequell said. Um, I feel that a lot of this became a lot worse and, and, and a lot, a lot more difficult to kind of, predict and to, and, and to be able to uh, follow up on when the whole social media um, thing came into play. Um, it has its blessings and its amazing things, meaning accessibility, because I'll be honest with you, <laughs> if you Google my name, there's a ton of stuff that you will read and see and connect to me, which I think is an amazing tool for that. Um, but also if you, if you just put in Vogue or Vogue dancing, in Google, you get a plethora of nonsense of knuckleheads like Mr. Jaquel described on TikTok doing a kickball change, combre, shall say, whatever nonsense that has nothing to do with Vogue, don't understand the language, don't understand the reasons for the movement. Um, it's a bit disrespectful. Is there really a lot you can do about it? Unfortunately, people are going to sell out. They're going to work for cheap or work for free. Um, and like Jaquel said, also those people now have to deal with someone not fully qualified to get the authentic version of what they're supposed to be getting. That's no longer your problem. You chose cheap, you get cheap. <laughs> Bottom line. 
um, I've been incredibly blessed. And, and although I've had some, you know, moments like that where I said, oh, how dare they? You know, it's like, okay, you know, I feel at my age with my experience that what's truly meant for me will always reach me. Um, but in the same breath, yes, I've given Sada to be like, really, they booked that? That's that's what they consider Vogue? That's what, that's what they call in Vogue these days? I, I am not the Vogue police, unfortunately. So I do my best to kind of educate through the platform of teaching online when I'm teaching in the studio and kind of give people information on what it is and so on and so forth. Um, now, the people that are hiring and booking the gigs, if they're looking for the cheap way out, I'm not going to spend an entire day explaining to you why you should hire me. I know why you should hire me. And, and this is, again, I keep going back to knowing your worth. And sometimes it's okay to say, you know what? You can have that gig. Because a lot of times those people, when they're, when they're half-stepping like that and they're paying people nonsense and they're booking these inexperienced people, they're not very serious to begin with. Nine out of 10 times, they're not people that are credible, professional, respectable to you or your craft. So I let them go. I'll give you a quick example. I was contacted by a TV show. Won't mention the name. Please submit your bio information, so on and so forth. I submitted my Alvin Ailey faculty profile. All my information, videos, clips, the whole bit. I was bypassed, I was overlooked. No one called me back. I said, okay, whatever. They reached out to me. Maybe I just don't fit the demographic that they're looking for, whatever. Three weeks later, they were at Alvin Ailey filming the show. That to me is a little insulting. You're filming a show about Vogue and the ballroom scene and the people voguing in the 1980s. You're filming it at my job where I teach Vogue, but I was not included in it. You have to take a deep breath and say, it wasn't really meant for me. They were looking for something else. Who am I to tell them what they were looking for? They have a different way that they hire people. We, Jacob, you know this, Billy, you know this. You have casting people that have no idea. They just see someone young and pretty and oh, they, they, they'll look good on camera that that's good, you know. But I think mm -hmm. once again, it's super important as, as people who are considered elders and experienced in this community to do our best to be a positive role model on our social media, on our platforms where people see us to, to not be the one posting stuff about drugs and nonsense. No, about really uplifting information and educational stuff. People will receive it little by little in that way, in person, connecting with people. But we unfortunately don't have a lot of control after in terms of people hiring and who they're gonna book over us. All we can do is be like if someone went to my Instagram right now and stuff, knock on wood, <laughs> there's nothing, you know, sexual or disrespectful or hateful or nothing. I try to do my best to make it positive. And that's all we can really do, you know, in my opinion, you know, speaking for myself. I swear y'all are making my job so easy. Um, <laughs> Because I was going to bounce next because, you, you know, we're running out of time and I could definitely talk to y'all for like another two hours. Um, but are they doing and they we are we doing the job, uh, a good job of avoiding the isms in commercial work? So ageism, sexism, um, genderism, racism, ableism. Um, and it, it, are, are, are the people who are hiring, are you as choreographers, directors, artists, are you doing a good job around making sure folks are included? And uh, is, is there more work that can be done? Um, I'll jump into this. I feel like I'm doing a really a great job, you know, especially being in the commercial space in the sense of like when you're working with pop stars and pop talent, you know, from when I used to watch my the Britney Spears videos and live performances, you know, it was the one black girls, the two, you know, the, the one black guy, you know, now being in the position that I've been blessed to be in, you know, I've been able to change that narrative, you know, and, let me hire 50 black females, you know, let me hire a cast of all African Americans, you know, and it's been mind blowing. You know, I get the chills now, even just thinking about <laughs> the days when I can do that. You know, um, I remember we were working on Super Bowl 
um, Beyonce did Super Bowl with Bruno Mars formation. And that was the first time all of those girls have ever been in the same room with that many black girls, you know? And the conversation was, they were always so used to fighting for a spot, you know, fighting for that one spot next to the artist, fighting for that one spot on the tour. And now it's only them in the room, you know? And it was so emotional for them. They, the first few days of rehearsals, they were just crying. Cause it was like, we've never been in this space where we're, next to my sister and my sister and my sister and my sister, you know? Um, so it's been really awesome to change the narrative and, and um, put the power back on, on our sides and to change, you know, a couple of years ago, you know, we wasn't seeing thighs, thighs and ass on TV. You know, now, now I can't hire you unless you got thighs and ass. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> it's like, you know, times have changed, you know? And um, I think that's great. I think it's beautiful to see, um, to see women taking, being proud of their curves, being proud of their skin, you know, being proud of their um, background, the hair, you know, um, all of these things that we, that we grew up, you know, neglecting or setting aside, you know, now we're seeing the beauty in who we are as a culture and as a people and as um, when it comes to dance and our genres and styles, you know, it's beauty, it's beauty in that, you know, but of course there's always more work to be done. Um, but I think we have to start somewhere, you know, you have to start somewhere. And as long as you're starting, regardless of who you are, regardless of how little the job is, regardless of how big the job is, we all have to start somewhere. And if you put the right foot forward, I think we can get there eventually. Thank you. Nalita, do you want to share? Uh, yes, Jaquel. Yes. And if I might continue that, uh, God, Michelle, that was a hard question to ask. And yeah, I think that we have the power to change the narrative when we start taking those things into consideration. Um, I'm working. I had the opportunity to be able to debut a, a solo show that now is incorporating dancers and it's called the Mekeng Soy. So that particular project is about a Latina Puerto Rican uh, flamenco dancer and all of that uh, that that entails, uh, which is my community, my people, and those sounds in relationship to flamenco. So how do we change the narrative and how would how do we f bring the power back to us so that we don't sell our integrity or our lineage or our ancestors or all and you know and you keep remembering everything that was the work that was done before us and referencing back those communities of where these, where these dances come from so i've been uh really really particular about the people that I've asked to work with me uh, partially because I number one they're all um, they're all amazing um, and they're all share we share parallel upbringings uh, we're in alignment with the way that we see dance uh, and with where we see ourselves as dancers in this diverse city um, and that are constantly encountered with those work opportunities where do you take the gig for the buck because you need to pay your bills um, and they're making you do say some things or even act certain things in certain ways that you know that you wouldn't you wouldn't sleep at night doing for instance uh so i i per personally am trying to do those things when it comes to hiring and giving a place for like-minded people to be able to partake in the studio with me on stage with me and i think that that's the way that we help elevate one another and that we bring forth other um similar voices 
uh, yeah, because that stuff, our backgrounds are, it's not for sale. There's no money. There's no money that you can pay me to, nah. to, to, it's like, you got to go home. It's like, I'll die. I'll eat a peanut butter jelly sandwich, but you got to keep it moving. Like just, I just, I'm not doing it. <laughs> Thank you. These are, what should we be doing to avoid the isms? Um, I personally have made it my duty, my responsibility to whenever I embark on any new projects, performances, showcases, or whatever, um, to make it accessible to everyone, gender, size, age, whatever. I mean, if you look at my shows and the stuff that people that are represented, um, I've had people perform in their 50s. <laughs> you know, that didn't think they would still be able to dance. And I'm like, you have a passion for it. I, I mean, to me, I, I'm, I'm a, a huge supporter of all genders, backgrounds. If you have a passion and you have a desire to do this, um, I give people those opportunities. I threw a ball on a float for gay pride. First time it's ever been done, coupled partnership with, with, a, with an, uh, a wine brand or whatever. So every time I'm connected to these opportunities i'm like who can i bring in so of course i was also in charge of casting and, and hiring people to come and perform and do all that i always am looking to give everyone an opportunity I'll, I'll quote something from a very popular song in 1990 by one of my friends who died many years ago he wrote a song called elements of vogue and the verse goes vogue the latest dance obsession a form of total self-expression with no regards to your profession elements of vogue Give your total exhibition, give your very own rendition, get ready for your first real session of Vogue. And I feel that like that applies to everyone. Madonna said it. Vogue is, makes no difference if you're black, white, boy, girl. This is the kind of, you know, the, the mantra I live by, that if I teach this dance, that my responsibility is to really give people a voice, a platform, an opportunity to feel valued, to feel empowered, to feel included, to feel validated. And that, that that means you could be, I've had people be like, oh, I feel like a dweeb, I'm too fat to, you're not too nothing. You're, you're, you're thinking too much. Allow yourself to be just you. No one is like you, no one can replace you. That's an amazing thing. I had to ask for permission to put men in high heel shoes at one of the performances. These are the times we're living in. I'm like, I'm not gonna water down the culture and not put them in high heel shoes because what will people think? No, this is the culture and I stand by the integrity of the culture, what it is, or there ain't gonna be a show. This is what I'm talking about and really standing firm in, in what you believe in. And I had an incident last year where I did a, not a year, year before, where we did a performance and I was accused of appropriation or something because I used a, a, an image, whatever. Long story short, I said, I'm not changing my number. I'm not changing the performance. It's part of the image. It's part of the show. It's part of my artistic integrity one person wrote in and was uncomfortable with it. 150 people in that, in that theater were giving us a standing ovation. What, what, what do we give more value to? That one person who goes to the Institute once every five years or those 150 people that were jumping up and down? You can't please everyone, but I think it's super important to, again, be very firm in what you believe in be authentic, be transparent, be supportive, be empowering, believe in yourself, take never take no for an answer and be a positive role model for people. At our core, we're all love. We all want to be loved, but also we want to be a source of inspiration because our mission here is what? To be of service to me, <laughs> to be of service, to serve others and to educate and to lift others up. That's the mantra I live by. Period. Period. <laughs> That's the wrap up, folks. <laughs> Unfortunately, we're out of time. I mean, literally, he wrapped it up for me. I was going to just drop a couple takeaways and just really quickly ask for a few last thoughts. But um, a quick takeaway, artists have the power. We are in power. Um, artists have to be contr in control of any adjustments and changes to the art form. Uh, not taking the job and learning to walk away. I know I hear that one a lot, but the folks on this panel have done it. So you can do it. Um, do not accept gift cards as a form of payment. Uh, <laughs> no, 
Get them gift cards out of here. Know your worth. Um, go back to community. So when these things do happen, reach out to your community and share with them as well. Let them know what's coming down the pipe and stick together so that you can make change. And uh, I think that's it, folks. Uh, I mean, this I cannot tell you how honored I am to have sit, sat with all of you on this panel and uh, find out more about you individually, but also how you work and how you are in service to our community. And with you at the helm, I'm like, I'm never been so happy to be a 50 year old black woman in the house and club community. I feel like I'm about to book all the jobs right now, just based on everything y'all told me. Um, no, but seriously, like it's really been an honor to get to know you. And I hope that um, people are walking away from here with some real value because these are people who are straddling the worlds that, you know, a lot of us have either not had the opportunity or 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 feel for feel fearful of going that route because um, of those things and of the reputation of the commercial world, but to know that there are other people on the other side advocating for you and and laying the groundwork for you and, and also then reaching back and enriching community and generations to come. Um, I, I'm super proud to, to have y'all representing cultural forums in those commercial worlds. So thank you. And shout out to the interpreters, because Brandon and Aisha, y'all been giving me all the Yeah, business. they've been down there killing it. <laughs> shout out. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I'm going to swing it back to Peter. Thank you, and have a good night. Wow. Thank you, Michelle. And thank you to our wonderful group of speakers, Nalita, Caesar, and Jacqueline, for today's insightful conversation. To our attendees, thank you for being avid contributors and offering your insight in all of the ways. A final thank you to Amy Armstrong from the Biscardi Center and Brandon Kazen Maddox and Aisha Simpson from LC Interpreting Services for their invaluable support. We're heading over to the, fo the session follow-up chat in the community section to take a few questions and wrap up the conversation. So what's next? One, you can continue to experience the symposium. Visit our sponsors in the exhibitor hall create virtual meetups and online conversations at our community board, or message other attendees and engage with the symposium thematic guides and digital program book. Today's Justice thematic guide was curated by Jonathan Gonzalez, who will also be leading the daily debrief session we have coming up next. Go to your HOVA agenda to navigate the debrief today. After that, we have a wonderful dance break with BHQ Red. Get your bodies moving after this full day of panels and important conversations. This will be followed by our virtual expo showcase, where exhibitors will go live from the booths with info sessions and more. Third, tonight's programming ends with a pivotal keynote conversation titled, Starting Again, A System Built for Us. Leading the conversation is our wonderful moderator, Nigel Whitson, joined by speakers Ahimsa Timoteo Bolgran, Claudia Norman, Linda Kuo, Kevin Gotkin, and Carol. Have a wonderful debrief session, dance break, virtual expo showcase and take some time off for yourself. We will be in community with you tonight for our keynote session. Cheers. <laughs>